Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him, as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers, and in particular on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad. As we greet you from Masjid al Aman in Birmingham, in Britain, with the Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Imam of this masjid, Maulana Abdul Haq, who is an elder with whom I love to sit and talk, and he would tell me about the times long ago. Allah has taken him away, and we pray that Allah may have mercy on his soul and forgive him his sins. Grant that he might see peace in his grave. And that he might be raised on judgment day and by Allah's kindness and mercy be blessed to enter into Jannah. Ameen. <laughs> Our topic uh, is um, Afghanistan, the way forward. This is the first time I'm lecturing in Britain for the last two years. And I'm very happy that my first lecture should be at uh, Masjid al Aman here in uh, Birmingham. Tomorrow night in Ilford in London we take a critically important subject biological warfare in Akhir al Aman. And then uh, for the rest of the week there will be other lectures. I'm hoping that we can schedule one on a subject I used to lecture on 20 25 years ago. And I moved on to other subjects. But now, because of Afghanistan, I have to come back again to repeat the subject Islam and the international monetary system. So, if you have the time and you can drive down to London, we'll be happy to see you there uh, for the next. I will be in London, in Britain, for another probably 10 days before I travel. Uh, back to Trinidad, inshallah. I lectured on the on the 15th of August in Islamabad on uh, implications for Islam of the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan. And as I was lecturing in Islamabad, the Yankee government in Kabul was falling. And uh, the, res the response to that lecture of mine uh, on the 15th of August was uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. But that subject was only, I could only touch the subject on that occasion. Uh, and I want to refresh your memories uh, I, I told the story, or the, I gave the information of 25 years ago when I was uh, based in New York. And I was just beginning my studies of Islamic eschatology. At that time, my field of study were really Islam and international relations. And uh, the Islamic Emirate had an ambassador in New York and he was a, a learned man. He was a man of great culture and refinement and uh, a thinker. And uh, we became friends. In those days there was no internet. So he would take all your cassettes of my lectures and send them to Kabul. Because the Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan was making a brave effort to try to establish itself. And they needed guidance. He reported to me that the ulama 
and the government in Kabul at that time deferred with me on two important subjects. The first was that they insisted that they had the right to seek to get recognition from the United Nations that they represented the government of Afghanistan so they could sit in the UN General Assembly. But with my view as to control the world. They couldn't see what I could see. And so they deferred with me. And they kept on their efforts to try to get recognition from the UN. They never got it. The second issue is that uh, they insisted because they got their education from the Darul Ulum. And the Darul Ulum, whether it be in Pakistan or in Afghanistan or in South Africa, wherever it is, still holds the view that the money which we're now using, the Pakistani rupee, the Afghan of Afghanistan, the Bangladeshi taka, the US dollar, the euro, the British pound, that these, these currencies were valid money, that they were halal. That was the position of the Darul Ulum. And my view, because I had been blessed, Allah blessed me, to study international monetary economics at two universities. And then to apply the Quran and the Hadith to the study of international monetary economics. I was probably unique in the world of Islam in this respect. And my view is that not only was it bogus and fraudulent and haram, but it had been created by the West to function as a vehicle for the exploitation, impoverishment and enslavement of the masses around the world. Exploitation, impoverishment and eventual enslavement of the masses around the world. This was my view and that was the Darul view. So they deferred with me. Two days, two days before 9-11, the ambassador, ambassador invited me to his home for, uh, for lunch, uh, maybe it was uh, Afghan Pilau, Kabuli Pilau, Kabuli Pilau. Uh, I had a very nice lunch with him. And then he said to me, Sheikh Imran, I have good news for you that the government in Kabul has agreed to meet with you. My gosh, that's really good news. To agree to meet with me, that's what he said. 25 years later, I don't know whether they agree to meet with me again. <laughs> he said there's a conference that you'll be attending in Lahore and they'll send a delegation to Lahore to meet with you. So I was excited, but then two days later, 9-11 took place. And I never heard from him again. I don't I didn't know whether he was alive or he was dead. I didn't know nothing about it. But he was a dear friend. While I was giving the lecture in the Islamabad on the 15th of August, there was someone in the gathering, perhaps from Kabul. And he said, This is the name of the man, and I won't mention his name. And he's still alive. <laughs> Your friend is still alive. He's in Kabul. In fact, he led the Afghan delegation in their talks with the United States in Doha in Qatar. He led the delegation. <laughs> so maybe that this lecture would reach him. <coughs> And may wish the leaders of the government in Kabul that they may get news from me 
if they have any respect for my views, that they should listen to, to this man and take guidance from him. Do not, do not turn away from him because this is one of the best that you have. Twenty-five years ago also there was no internet <laughs> and there was no smartphone to take photographs. As a consequence of which the news could be now transmitted instantaneously around the world through the internet and photographs can be transmitted instantly around the, around the world. And so Afghanistan my first message to you is today is different from 25 years ago. Not only do we have instant information and instant photographs, and so any, any, anything that is negative that happens in Afghanistan would be broadcast all around the world on every television station. The war is not over. Yes, they have withdrawn their military forces from Afghanistan, but the war is still continuing. And one of the front frontiers of that war is propaganda warfare. There are two things which two other things which have changed since the last Islamic Emirate 20-25 years ago. Number one, <coughs> this is my Islamic eschatological view. And when I give a view of mine, you all know it. But I always insist that you should not accept my view unless and until you are convinced that it is correct because I want, I want to encourage you to think. I'm not being malicious. And I'm not being false when I speak. And I say that the Darul Loom is no longer thinking. No. I'm not waging war on the Darul Loom. The Darul Loom, for those who don't know, is the institution of higher Islamic learning which produces the scholars of Islam. In the Arab world it's called the Jamia. The Darul Loom now has become an institution where knowledge is packaged and simply transferred from one generation to another mechanically. And so you're not allowed to think anymore in the Darul. Knowledge is complete. You just have to read and study the books. But my audience would know <laughs> that Allah sent the Quran to people who think. And so until the end of the world, Allah expects us to continue to think. And my teacher of blessed memory, Maulana, Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari, he used to stand up in the classroom and say to all the students of the Alimia Institute of Islamic Studies, he would say, I'm proud of Imran because when I'm dead and gone, no longer in this world, he would not be a parrot simply repeating everything I said. Rather, he would have critically assessed whatever was taught. And only when he was convinced would he accept it. And then in the years to come when he teaches, it will be his knowledge that he teaches. Not knowledge that is mechanically transferred from one generation to another. And so my Islamic eschatological view 
is that history has now arrived at that moment when the next great event to take place in the world is the great war that our prophet Allah bless him be upon him has described as the Malhama. And in uh, the previous Ummah they describe it as Armageddon. And it is a war which he described as one in which 99 out of every 100 who fight in the war would be killed. There's never been a war like that in history. And I therefore conclude, and again this is my view, that a war which kills 99% of all combatants has to be a war using weapons of mass destruction not simply machine guns and therefore nuclear war, thermonuclear war. The president of Russia, who is a man of few words, but when he talks, the world better listen. Oh yes. He said, we can destroy the whole of the United States of America in half an hour. That is the kind of weapons that Russia now has. Which is why the United States cannot intervene militarily in Afghanistan. They dare not intervene militarily, sorry, in um, Venezuela, not like that, Venezuela. Um, after having intervened willy-nilly all over South and Central America for 200 years, changing governments and they only wanted Gunboat, gunboat diplomacy is called. For the first time in 200 years, the United States has been halted. They cannot intervene militarily in, a, in, in Venezuela. Why? Because Russia says we can destroy the whole of the United States in half an hour. That is an indication of what kind of war is coming. 25 years ago we were not on the brink of the Great War. But today we are in the brink of the Great War. And whether the government in Afghanistan is still persuaded after 25 years that they must seek UN recognition. <laughs> if they have not learned any lesson in 25 years, well, I have a message to them from Birmingham. And that is that my understanding of Surah to Rahman of the Quran, when Allah speaks and He says, And He repeats it how many times? 31. 31 times. Never has this occurred in the Quran except here. One verse repeated 31 times. Since the Darul Rum is no longer thinking, I don't think you'll benefit from asking them why has Allah repeated this verse 31 times. But for those who are studying Islamic eschatology, Ilmu Akhir Islamat, we know that Allah has repeated this verse 31 times because He wants us to be alerted that there is information in this surah which is of critical importance. Don't miss it. We don't have the time to speak today on Surah Al-Rahman. But one verse, سَدَفْرُقُ لَكُمْ we're going to deal with both of you. We're going to deal with both of you. Meaning the alliance of Shayateen on this side and on that side the jinn, which has produced modern Western civilization. And so we have come to the conclusion that the Great War is one in which 
modern Western civilization is going to be not only defeated, but crippled. Crippled. What remains of the West after the Great War will play no significant role in the world. This, of course, is a necessary requirement if a Pax Judaica is to replace a Pax Americana. It should not be difficult for you to understand. Why. But the modern Western civilization is going to be defeated in this great war which is coming. You don't need a PhD from MIT to know that the United Nations will be gone. <laughs> there will be no United Nations organization after the Great War. So my message to Afghanistan is would you kindly stop your effort to try to please the United Nations and get recognition from the United Nations that you are the legitimate government of Afghanistan. Not only will they never give it to you, but you engage in a futile effort which is at variance with your, the truth in your religion. The second thing which has changed in these 25 years, and I hope that they're listening to me in Kabul, is that the monetary system, these 25 years, has played an increasingly devilish role in tightening the rope of monetary slavery around the necks of mankind. When I arrived in Pakistan in 1964, I spent one year at al -Azhar University, one academic year, at the age of 21, and then left al Azhar University. I created history. <coughs> the first student probably to have left al Azhar to go to study in Pakistan. I created history. <laughs> well, I, I didn't go to Pakistan to join the Darul I went to Pakistan to study with Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari. And that was the best decision I ever made in my life. The scholarship that the world is now admiring, the scholarship that I represent, is a scholarship which is built on the thought of Maulana Dr. Muhammad, Father Rahman Ansari, Rahim of Allah. When I arrived in 1964, one US dollar was equivalent to one rupee 75 paisa. Did you hear that? Any Pakistanis here? One rupee 75 paisa. How much is it now? 170. 200 plus. 270. No, 170. What? About, about 175 rupees to one dollar. Oh, from one rupee seventy-five paisa to one US, now it's about one hundred and seventy-five. And in the process, this collapse of the rupee is not unique. Take a look at Algeria, and you see what happened to the Algerian dinar. Take a look at the Indonesian rupiah. Take a look at the Turkish lira. <laughs> huh? Take a look at the. Uh, at the Venezuelan Bolivar. Money is collapsing around the world, particularly amongst those who are resisting the West. But those who are comfortable with the West and who are a client of the West and supporting the West, like the, the, the state of Singapore, Oh, your money is always strong. At the time when I arrived in Pakistan, 
the rope was already around the neck of Pakistan, the monetary rope. But it wasn't tight. 75 years, 76, 50 something years later, the rope around the neck of Pakistan is so tight that they have to be scurrying here and there to try to borrow money to pay interest on the loans so that they don't default. So times have changed and Kabul should understand this. If the Islamic Emirate that is now restored in, in Kabul is to succeed, you've got to think, you've got to pursue knowledge, you've got to understand what is happening in the world of money. The Dharma will not teach you that. I can teach it to you. My students can teach it to you because we've been teaching the subject of Islam and the international monetary system for 20, 25 <coughs> years now. We have a lot of experience in it. As money falls, and since the Taliban took over, this is the first time I'm using the word Taliban, I normally don't use it. The 15th of August. Guess what, guess what is happening to the Afghan? The money in Afghanistan is called it Afghan. You know what's happening to it? It's collapsing. It's collapsing. As money falls in value, they don't know it, so let me teach it to them. As money falls in value, there is a continuous transfer of wealth from the masses to a, to a predatory elite, both internal and external. And as that continues over a period of time, you end up with what you have today in the economy of Pakistan. In the economy of Pakistan, and it, it should not be annoyed Pakistanis if I speak the truth. I'm the teacher. I have to teach the truth, whether you like it or not, whether you're comfortable with it or not. I'm not anti-Pakistan when I say your economy is one of slave masters and slaves. That's what the, that's what the Pakistani economy is. An economy of slave masters and slaves. I didn't realize it until I arrived in Pakistan. And then I learned to my great surprise, sorrow, that there were people who were working in Islamabad full time and earning 16, 17, 18,000 rupees a month. which is less than a hundred US, much less than a hundred pounds a month. And less than a hundred pounds. Much less than a hundred pounds. And uh, the man's wife and children have to remain in the village. <coughs> he can't afford to ring them to Islamabad. And he can't afford to go back to his village often. <coughs> so his little daughter goes to sleep every night crying for Papa. That's right. Crying for Papa. And you are earning 300,000 rupees a month. <coughs> and you can afford a driver. Chokidar. Chokidar is your security officer a cook, a gardener, a nanny for the children because this is the slave wage that you're paying. So Afghanistan, you must, you must understand that as money falls in value, you are moving more and more towards 
an economy of slave masters and slaves. And this is oppression. So what do you do? As economic oppression intensifies in Afghanistan, as economic hardship and suffering intensifies in Afghanistan, the news will be transmitted all over the world. The photographs will be going all over the world. And the propaganda warfare, which is being waged against Afghanistan, will be full scale. This is how the world has changed in 25 years. But there are some things that we must show credit, positive things that have happened in these 25 years. And I want to enter into the record today from Birmingham. I am not, I have never been the supporter of President Donald Trump. And I hope no schoolboy will get me angry by accusing me of becoming a supporter. But Donald Trump, President Donald Trump, has to be credited. That since, nine, since the year 2016, we have not had war with Russia. I'm not aware, have you? Are you aware? The schoolboy will say yes. <laughs> The world has been safe from nuclear war with Russia since 2016 and we have to credit Donald Trump for that. There are those who will grind their teeth in frustration and anger that I should speak these words. Well, let me tell them, I don't care, two peanuts for you. My duty is to proclaim the facts and the truth. Secondly, it is Donald Trump who must be credited for taking the wise decision, although all of America is now up in arms against him in the military, to bring the war in Afghanistan to an end. It was a wise decision on his part. But not only did he show wisdom, and now these comments are directed to that bunch of uh, from Dajjal warriors called ISIS, but the Islamic resistance in Afghanistan must also be credited for having responded to Trump. These schoolboys don't study the Quran. But Allah has said in the Quran that if your opponent inclines to peace, you must reciprocate. And so when the United States reached out to Afghanistan with the Taliban to say we, we want to withdraw, we want to withdraw peacefully to end the war. It was wise and correct on the part of Taliban to enter into talks in Doha, in Qatar, to bring the war to an end peacefully. And credit must be given to Donald Trump for that. Why did NATO invade Afghanistan in the first place. If we are to address the subject Afghanistan the way forward, we got to step back before we can step forward. And this is my view now. 25 years ago I couldn't think this way. Now I can understand because of eschatology. I didn't know anything about Gog and Magog 25 years ago. Now I know it. The Gog and Magog are those who control power in the modern West. 
אמרו לנו שאיזה דקוראן הוא אהוב מן כל אחד הבניין סילון. קריטיקלי אימפורטנט פארט אוף דה וורס אוף דה קוראן. אין סורה תולנביה. ‫ואז הם יתפרדו על כל העולם. ‫ואז הפרופס של להתפרדו על כל העולם ‫זה להיות יכול לקחת את הכוח ‫על כל העולם. ‫כדי שהם יתפרדו על כל העולם. ‫ואף אחד של העולם ‫יכול להתפרדו על כל העולם. ‫מהזמן שאתה מתפרדו על כל העולם, ‫הם יבואו אחריך. ‫זאת אומרת... We now face war with Russia and China because Russia is not prepared to bend its knee and China is not prepared to bend its knee. That's why the great war is coming. Twenty-five years ago, the Soviet Union not Russia. Again, this is a mistake I made. I didn't know the difference between the Soviet Union and Russia at that time. Still a schoolboy at that time. The Soviet Union intervened and invaded Afghanistan, not Russia. Afghanistan had to fight the Soviet Union, not Russia. Russia is a Christian country, an Orthodox Christian country. Russia is now returning to her Orthodox Christian heart. But the Soviet Union was an atheist state, destroying religion, not just Islam, but Orthodox Christianity. And the Soviet Union had responded to the Islamic Revolution in Iran with fright, with terror. We're afraid now if this revolution expands, it's going to cause problems for us in the Soviet Union because we have so many Muslim states in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union intervened in December 1979. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. December 1979. And invaded and occupied Afghanistan. And the West curry favored with Saddam Hussein to attack Iran from the other side to contain the revolution. And the Soviet Union fought in Afghanistan for 10 years, 79 to 89, I think until they accepted defeat and they withdrew. And when the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, then in the early 90s, the Islamic Emirate emerged in Afghanistan. The only country in the world of Islam which was making a credible effort to become a Khilafa state. The only country in the world of Islam which was making a credible effort to become a Khilafa state. They never achieved it, but they had their heart in the right place. And the Gog and Magog world order, the modern Western world, number one could not tolerate the existence of any part of the world of Islam seeking to restore a Khilafah state. And so that was one of the reasons why after the Islamic Emirate had been in existence for a few years, they had to concoct some reason for an in invading Afghanistan. And now I realize, I wish, I wish I had realized it earlier because I'm supposed to be a scholar of international relations. But I have to confess 
Now I realize, I wish I realized it earlier, that 9-11 was planned primarily, primarily to deal with the Islamic Emirate, to destroy the Islamic Emirate, to ensure that no part of the world of Islam should ever have a chance to try to establish and maintain a Khilafah state. The second reason for 9-11 was because the Prophet ﷺ had prophesied that an army will come from Khorasan and whether the schoolboy accepts it or does not is irrelevant. Afghanistan is clearly a part of Khorasan. All the evidence on the ground supports the view that Afghanistan is a part of Khorasan. Whether the schoolboy accepts it or he does not is irrelevant. So the emergence of an Islamic Emirate in Afghanistan was causing terror in Israel because of that prophecy. A prophet Muhammad Now don't say, you know, Imran Hussein said Taliban is the army that the prophet prophesied. <laughs> don't go and spread that nonsense. <laughs> I've never said that. I have said that this is a sign which emerged 25 years ago that Afghanistan is able to defeat a superpower, the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union had to withdraw, indicating a capacity to fight. Afghanistan doesn't have much capacity to think, but they have capacity to fight. To fight. Right. That's why I'm delivering these lectures to try to guide them, to teach them, that they don't make mistakes. So the emergence of the Islamic Emirate 25 years ago was also a threat to Israel. And so 9-11 was planned to provide an, an excuse to invade Afghanistan and to put an end to the Islamic Emirate. No, 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 Afghanistan will have to emerge like Pakistan, a modern Republican state. Is there any Pakistani who defers with me? <laughs> if you want to defer with me, do your homework first, huh? <laughs> and now look at the story. They spent 20 years to destroy the Islamic Emirate. And at the end of 20 years, guess what happened? I'm repeating now what I said, I believe I said it in Islamabad, that they trained an Afghan army for the Yankee government in Kabul. We were 300,000 strong. That's the figure I got. I don't know if it's correct or not. And they gave this army state-of-the-art weapons and all the money that they needed. They're not in short supply of US dollars because, you know, you didn't have to take a piece of paper and print it and make a money. Eh? And all the monkeys in the world would accept it as valid money. <laughs> Look at the story now. Amazing, isn't it? You spent 20 years trying to destroy the Islamic Emirate. And as soon as the announcement is made that we are withdrawing by such and such a date, and the withdrawal process begins, the Islamic resistance in Afghanistan suddenly moves forward like a tiger and starts taking over the country. And the Afghan army of the Yankee government is terrorized and they start making deals with Afghanistan with the uh, Taliban 
to surrender. And it took only two weeks and the whole thing collapsed. And Ashraf Ghani had to flee and desert his people and then give this monstrous lie that I, I left to protect my people from civil war. What a lie. <laughs> no, he left like a thief in the dark. <laughs> he will listen to these words wherever he is and he'll have to bite his tongue <laughs> in anger. And as soon as the government in Kabul collapsed, the United States and the West was faced with this same Islamic emirate that they had 25 years ago. Is that not a sign that you cannot, you cannot defeat Afghanistan? There's only one part of the world of Islam, only one, which has never been defeated. They call it the, the graveyard of empires. So today we have to not only give credit to Donald Trump for having wisely uh, negotiated with them to end the war. And he has to be given credit for that. Not only him, but they have to be given credit for having responded positively and reach an agreement with the United States and to fulfill their part of the agreement. But also we have to give credit to those who fought bravely for 20 years to ensure that one part of the world of Islam still remains unconquered and unconquerable. That part of the world of Islam of which Prophet Muhammad spoke and said but an army will come from there and no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. It is therefore clear, this is the argument I made on the August 15, <coughs> that the events of Afghanistan these last one month, month and a half and the 20 years of successful resistance is a clear sign to the entire world that Islam still has a role to play in history. That Islam is not in the museums of history. It is not an obsolete force in the world. You have not been able to subdue Islam. Islam is still alive. And Islam has a role to play in history. Well then, what is the Islamic Emirate likely to face now? 25 years ago, 20 years ago, they faced 9-11. <coughs> Our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, he warned. I don't know whether Muslims living in Britain are aware of it. <coughs> he said about Akhir al-Zaman, he said that there'll be great liars, so beware. And when they tell their lies, it's because they want to come after you. <coughs> and he said holding on to Islam will be like holding on to hot coals, hot coals. Mm -hmm. There are those who have left Bangladesh and left Pakistan and left Egypt and left Algeria and come to France and Britain in search of a better way of life. In search of, a, of wealth and comfort. And they don't want an Islam that's like hot coals. No, 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 no. You must preach an Islam that's like marshmallow. <laughs> these, ma these marshmallow Muslims should attend my lecture tomorrow night. And they know what is the fate awaiting them. The topic is biological warfare and Akhirul Zaman. 
And so Pakistan, so Afghanistan, you must know, you finished the easy part in fighting NATO successfully. That was the easy part. This is the difficult part now. After they have left, withdrawn their troops, they're going to be continuing to wage the war against you by other means. And uh, there's a verse of the Quran in which Allah has said about Jews and Christians, meaning Jews and Christians who are both on the same wavelength, who are friends and allies of each other. You know what he says? وَلَن تَرْضَى عَنْكَ الْيَهُودِ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ They are not going to leave you at all. They're going to keep on coming against you, coming after you, until they get you to join their way of life, until they get you to become carbon copies of themselves. You want the evidence that we are becoming carbon copies? Shall I give you the evidence? Oh, I'd love to do this. Let me drink some water first. <laughs> it's not just the money that we're going to turn to now, the monetary system. It's not just the banking system. It's not just the, the political system, the international organizations like the UN and the IMF and so on. Every prophet of Allah will wash his hands before eating. Imam al-Mahdi will wash his hands before eating. If you live to see Nabi Isa -Islam, Jesus return, I have to teach the Christian world now, they've forgotten it, that you see Jesus washing his hands before eating. Why do we wash our hands before eating? Because Allah has designed the hand and designed the fingers in this way that you use your hands, use your fingers to eat. That's why you wash them. That alliance of Jews and Christians which gave us modern Western civilization says that it is barbarism. You are barbarians if you touch the food with your hands. No, no, no. There's cutlery. And civilized people will always use cutlery to eat. They will not touch the food with their hands. So if you give them some Dumba Karahi and an Afghan naan, you will see them taking a knife and fork and cutting the naan into pieces. <laughs> And then they take the fork and stick it in a piece of naan and dip the naan. <laughs> it's so funny. Whereas we would take the naan and break it and we would dip it with our hands. And we we'll eat the dumbakara. I'm talking about dumbakara because long time we used to talk about biryani. <laughs> but after going to fish hour now it's dumbakara. <laughs> when I go to Morocco I'll talk about couscous. <laughs> so you're not supposed to touch the food with your hands. And today I go to a gathering of scholars of Islam. We invited for dinner, and I'm the only one 
I'm the only one who asks, where can I wash my hands? Nobody else. وَلَنْ تَرْلَا عَنْكَ الْيَهُودَ وَلَنْ نَصَارَ حَتَّى تَتَّبِعَ مِلَّتَهُمْ They will not be contented until they force you to become a carbon copy of themselves. So then why should Afghanistan walk the extra mile to please them? Which is what they're doing now. <laughs> Which is what they're doing now. The new Islamic Emirate is trying to walk the extra mile to please them, to get a good image in the world. That is what you're doing. And my warning to you is you're on the wrong path. Your primary duty is to remain faithful to the truth regardless of consequences. And in the process, whatever you have to suffer, you suffer with patience. Well then, how should Afghanistan move forward? Instead of seeking to join them with, with cutlery when you're eating Dumba Karadi and Nan. Remaining faithful to your normal way of life. The Afghan people, mashallah, 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 have not given up their clothing. No, they have not given up their clothing. You go over to Pakistan and you find half Kota Shalwar and half Western clothing. <laughs> but in Afghanistan, it is almost universal that they stayed faithful to their native clothing. That's how you should deal with the West. <laughs> Stay faithful to your way of life, regardless of the price you have to pay. Well then, how can we survive if we are isolated? That is what they're going to ask me. How can we survive if we are isolated in the world? And my answer to you is no, you are favorably placed geographically. You have Pakistan on one side and you have Iran on the other side. And in addition to this, you have a friend in China and you have a friend in Russia. So the way forward for Afghanistan is forget the West and maintain friendly ties, brotherly ties with Pakistan and with Iran and do not allow them to try to cause friction between you. And number two, maintain close ties with China and with Russia if you are to survive. I now want to turn to the first priority for Afghanistan. And uh, then I want to turn to relations with Russia and with end. This does not complete the subject at all. There's much more to come. But this is my second lecture on the subject and I hope these words will reach them in Kabul. Your first priority is the suffering of your people who have suffered for 20 years of American oppression and who are now suffering even more with the Afghan money collapsing. So economic hardship is your first challenge. As the Afghan money collapses more and more, your predicament becomes more and more dangerous. What to do? How to respond? You take a Maulana and you put him in the Afghan Central Bank. Does he know the subject of money? 
what is money in the Quran? What is money in the Sunnah? I mentioned it in my lecture in Islamabad and I'm disappointed that more than one month has passed since August 15th and yet there is no sign of any announcement from Kabul. The dinar and dirham would be legal tender in Afghanistan. Legal tender means that it, it can be legally used as money. If a man is working, a laborer, then he can ask his employer, you must pay me my wage in dinar and dirham. And the law requires that he must pay him in dinar and dirham. What is a dinar? Dinar, the word dinar is in the Quran. And the dinar in the Quran is made of gold, a gold coin. Dirham is a silver coin. And dirham is also in the Quran. And this is also in the Sunnah. Money in the Quran and money in the Sunnah is dinar and dirham. <coughs> I don't know why the Dara room does not teach this. If Afghanistan is to survive monetary warfare being waged on them, then this is the only road available to survive. To declare dinar and dirham as legal tender. The question that arises, where will we get the gold coins and the silver coins? The answer is, from the time there is a demand in the market for anything, this is business. The businessmen will find the dinar and dirham and bring it to the market. You'll be surprised how soon Iranian businessmen will bring dinar and dirham in the market. Pakistani businessmen will bring it to the market. When the dinar and dirham are in the market, then an employer will have to go to the market and buy the dinar and dirham and pay wages in dinar and dirham. What will you use to buy the dinar and dirham? Because the merchants may say, we don't want your Afghan paper money. This paper money is heading up to the garbage bin. I don't want it. It's falling in value every day. Then you have a problem. Then you may have to resort at that time if you have, if you have the bogus U.S. dollars and euros and sterling and so on, if you have it in Afghanistan, you can, they will take that. The businessmen will take that. But the other way is, of course, through barter. Through barter. And uh, there's one more way. And I now have to spend a few minutes in teaching what is money in Islam. A hundred years ago I wouldn't have to do this because we had knowledge in the world a hundred years ago. And a hundred years later the ignorance is pathetic despite the explosion of information in the world. Knowledge is declining. Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu once came to the Prophet Islam, and offered him some dates. The Prophet Islam, looked at the dates and he said, Bilal, these are very high quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal said, O Messenger of Allah, I had two kilograms. I'm using modern weights. That time they used a saw. I had two kilograms of inferior quality dates. They were worth about five pounds each, so ten pounds worth of dates. And I exchanged them for this one 
kilogram of superior quality dates, which is worth about 10 pounds. In value, the exchange was a valid exchange, in value. This was worth 10 pounds, this was worth 10 pounds. The Prophet ﷺ replied and said, Bilal, this is the essence of riba. An unequal exchange of dates is the essence of riba. But Umar radiallahu ta'ala who exchanged four camels for one. These were baby camels, this is an adult. And an unequal exchange of camels was not riba. Why would an unequal exchange of dates be haram and riba? And an unequal exchange of camels would not be haram and not be riba. A schoolboy could answer that question a hundred years ago. Today even the Darulum cannot answer it. The answer to the question is located in this command of the Prophet. Listen to what he said. He said, if a transaction involves an exchange of gold for gold, <coughs> silver for silver, wheat for wheat, there are lots of wheat in Pakistan, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, dates for dates, or salt for salt. It has to be an exchange that is equal, equal for equal. If you have one kilo here, you must have one kilo here. And it must be hand-to-hand -hand meaning cash transaction, not credit. Other than that, it's riba. What is there common to all six? Gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, and salt. Go ask your Maulana. Go ask your Mufti. Go ask your Daralum. Send an email. Ask them, what is it that is common to all six? The reason why I'm raising my voice is the frustration I've been with 25 years now. The answer is all you need is a little bit of capacity to think. One pound of thinking, one sterling pound is enough. What is common to all six, gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, and salt, is that they were all used as money. That is what is common. What is money? Money is that which is used as a medium of exchange. I want to buy tomatoes, but I cut hair, my baba. So I cut your hair and you pay me. And you pay me with that which I can go in the market and buy tomatoes. So a medium of exchange. If it's barter, and I went and I had my hair cut. And when it's time to pay, I offered him a copy of Jerusalem and the Quran. <laughs> <laughs> he looks at me and says, Sheikh, I don't want to be disrespectful to you. But I can't use this to buy tomatoes. <laughs> so take him all back. But uh, the limitations. But if I pay him in money, he can use that money to go and buy the tomatoes. A medium of exchange. Number two, money is used as a measure of value. How much is the cost of a haircut? And how much is the cost of a kilo of tomatoes? A measure of value. 
And thirdly, and most important of all, money must function as a faithful store of value. I work for the whole month and I get my salary. And my salary could buy a camel. And I keep on doing the same job. And then I get a salary, same salary, but it can't buy a camel anymore, it can only buy a jackass. Get up. <laughs> and then after some time, it can't buy a donkey anymore, it can only buy a, a cow, uh, I mean a goat. And if you're in Indonesia, then after what? You can't buy a goat anymore, you can't buy a chicken. <laughs> this money is not storing value. It's leaking. And Suratul Kaf has given us an indication of how money should function successfully. Do you remember? You're not shaking your head. Suratul Kaf. Money, storing value over 300 years in Surah al -Kaf. What have you? You're not shaking your heads. The young man went to sleep, they put to sleep. And after 300 years, the money that they had could still buy the food. All right? But I'll tell you something. Fifty years ago when I was a student in Pakistan, if you had five rupees in your pocket, you're okay. Oh yes, you're comfortable with five rupees in your pocket. Today five rupees can't even buy chai. So the Pakistani rupee has not functioned faithfully as a store of value. A store of value. But the money that the young man had in the cave functioned successfully as a store of value. All six were used as money. Gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates and salt. All six had intrinsic value. The value of the money was located in the money. The Western world came and banished this money and replaced it with money which has fictitious value. Fictitious value. The value of the money is located outside the money and it can be manipulated and eventually you ripped off. <coughs> I'm teaching this lesson for Kabul because 25 years ago Kabul didn't understand this. And if 25 years later Kabul still cannot understand, somebody should close down the Darulum. Money in Islam is either gold and silver coins or when gold and silver coins are in short supply in the market, the money can be articles of food consumption. Articles of food consumption. Commodities of food consumption. Which are in an abundant supply in the market and which have a shelf life. So we can't use animals as money. Animals die. We can't use mangoes as money. Mangoes rot. So if Afghanistan has a shortage of gold and silver coins in the market, what should they do? What did they do in Medina? 
Answer. In Mania, they used dates as money. And it was because dates were used as money. That is why he said to Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala, that this is the essence of riba. If dates is being used as money, then I can become a money lender. I lend you one kilo of dates and you return me two kilos of dates. A hundred percent interest. By accepting this, this unequal exchange of dates, you're opening the door for the money lender. That's why it was haram and it was riba. Now then, to conclude this subject, if Afghanistan declares dinar and dirham to be legal tender, as I hope they will, and you do not have an adequate supply of dinar and dirham in the market, what do you do in Afghanistan? Answer, you have to, if you are in Cuba, you do sugar as money. Is that so difficult for the Darulum to understand? When will they start to think? People want guidance and you stop thinking. Not only thinking, they don't think anymore. They shut the doors of the masjid to me wherever I go. I was invited, I won't tell you which city, in England. <laughs> and uh, the, mas the masjid said, yes, we looked love to have him and i said okay i'll come and lecture on uh, the quran and the moon because that's the most important subject now the quran and the moon my book is written you should get the book if you can't get the book get, um, download it from the internet the quran and the moon so the masjid said no 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 we don't want this subject alone we want you to also talk on eschatology make it half count I said, no, this topic is too important. I'm going to give a full lecture on the Quran. I'm going to give a second lecture on eschatology. So I put in two different days. So then they start searching for another masjid to give one lecture and this masjid to the other lecture. And that masjid then told this masjid, you know who is Imran Hussein? And then they cancel the lecture. They <laughs> <laughs> cancel the lecture. So it's not just that they're not thinking anymore. I won't mention the name of the city. It's not just that they don't think anymore. They don't want me to teach what they cannot teach. So if you're in Cuba, you can use sugar as money. Not tobacco, eh? Fidel Castro stopped smoking. <laughs> and if you're in Indonesia, in Java, you'd use Rice is money, not rice which is polished, the rice with it, husk on it. Paddy, I think it's called paddy. Now, I don't know what would be used in Afghanistan. I don't, I've never been to Afghanistan. After Ramadan, I hope I can travel again to Islamabad, and this time try to go to Kabul for the first time, inshallah. <laughs> Uh, any Afghans here? What do you have in Afghanistan you can use as money? Hard question. Hard question. What's that? Hard question. Hard question. Mm -hmm. If you don't have anything in Afghanistan, then the best thing to do is make a deal with Pakistan and use wheat. Abundance of wheat in Pakistan. <coughs> Everywhere I turn, I see the wheat field ready for reaping the <laughs> harvest. So use wheat as money, okay? Because that's what the prophet said: gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, or so. Well. Of course, when you're using wheat as money, most of it will be micro transaction, not big transaction. You won't buy a motor car with wheat. But that's what the, ma the market needs. The market needs more dirham than dinar. So this is the way forward. If Afghanistan is not to be swallowed 
by a collapse of his money. And the people are not to descend into even further poverty and destitution that they're already facing. One last comment to make now on external relations. I spoke about friendship with Pakistan, friendship with Iran, Russia, and China. But now I want to concentrate on Russia. If you are an Islamic Emirate, then your knowledge must come from the Quran. And the Quran has absolute truth. al haqqul yaqeen is absolute truth. And the Quran tells us that there are two kinds of Christians. There are those Christians who are in alliance with Jews, and I quoted the verse already. They will never be contented until they get you to become carbon copies of themselves. But the Quran also prohibits you from maintaining friendly ties with them or being their allies. Erdogan, of course, does know that. I don't know if he has time to study the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَتَّقِذُوا الْيَهُودَ وَالنَّصَارَ أَوْلِيَا بَعْدُهُمْ أَوْلِيَا بَعْدُهُمْ وَمَنْ يَتَوَلَّهُ مِنْكُمْ فَإِنَّهُ مِنْهُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَهْدِ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ O you who have faith in this Quran, do not take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies who are, who are, who are themselves friends and allies of each other. Let me repeat it. Do not take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies who are themselves friends and allies of each other. That is precisely the, Jew the Jewish Christian Alliance, which is at the heart of the modern West today. It's called the Zionist Alliance. And whosoever from amongst you turn to them for friendship and alliance by joining NATO, like joining NATO, you belong to them. You don't belong to us. So if you are in the embrace of NATO, and you're doing nothing, nothing, nothing to condemn it. Nothing, nothing, nothing to get out of it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. That you're part of them, you're not a part of us. It's going to be difficult for the Muslims in the Balkans to swallow this. Difficult. I'm just coming from Albania now. I spent 17 days in Albania. Difficult for Muslims of the Balkans to swallow this. Anybody from Albania? Macedonia? Nobody. Do not take Jews and Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other. And whosoever from amongst you turn to them for friendship and alliance, like joining NATO, you belong to them. You don't belong to us. And Allah does not provide guidance for a wicked people. That's one part of the Christian world. But the Quran speaks about another part of the Christian world. A people who follow the Messiah. Not those who reject the Messiah. The ones who follow the Messiah. Part of the Israelite world accepted him. And part rejected him. That part which accepted him came to be known as a Nasara. Today they call Christians. 
and that part which rejected him are now called al Yehud. They may not like the definition, but we don't have to satisfy them. We just have to be faithful to the Quran. They call Jews, the ones who reject the Messiah. And Allah says, I will help this side. And this side will overcome that side. That help will continue forever. So Christians, there are Christians who will consistently be helped by Allah. The Quran speaks about, in a whole surah of the Quran, it speaks about room. And room is Constantinople. <laughs> Rome is not Chicago. Rome is not Singapore. Rome is Constantinople. And Rome is not Rome in Italy. Rome is Constantinople. But we have plenty of schoolboys in the world today. What can I do? And this Constantinople, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad wasalam, already had the Trinity and already worshipping Jesus as God. <coughs> Did you hear that? Constantinople at the time of the Prophet when the Quran was revealed, was already a Constantinople which had accepted the Trinity and was worshipping Jesus as God. Despite that, Allah prophesied in the Quran. The room was defeated in the land close by. But after this defeat, they will be victorious. Why? Be Nasrillah with Allah's help. Allah will help them. And this is exactly what happened. And the Roman, the Byzantine Empire defeated the Persian Empire. So they are a Christian people who will be helped by Allah. Two more verses of the Quran. Nabi Isa Islam is about to be crucified and he doesn't know what's going to happen. So Allah speaks to him and the conversation is recorded in the Quran. It's still there up to now in Surah to Ali Imran. Ya Isa, O Jesus, inni mutawaffik, I'm going to take, take what? Take your wallet? Take what? Take your soul. Wafat. In Pakistan, it's Fort Hogia. Fort Hogia. Wafat. I'm going to take your soul. Or I feel and I'm going to raise you unto myself. But they will believe that he is dead. But Allah says, no. I will make it appear to them like that. Allah never sent this load of rubbish. Allah never said this load of rubbish. Well, I was a bit in that because Allah would get someone to assume the appearance of Jesus. Well, I was a bit in that. And that innocent man who never ever claimed to be a messiah. He is crucified in the place of the messiah. That is injustice. And whosoever insists on continuing to believe in this load of rubbish, the theory of substitution, prepare to defend it on judgment day. Prepare yourself. So I'm going to take your soul and raise you unto myself. 
and cleanse you wa mutahhiruka min alladhina kafaru cleanse you of all the kufr they have heard against you now listen wa ja'ilu alladhina taba'uka fawka alladhina kafaru ila yawmil qiyamah any any here with arabic as your mother tongue one or he understands immediately <laughs> he understands immediately eh? he has arabic as his mother tongue and i am going to cause those who follow you tabauka ittiba i'm going to cause those who follow you to be raised raised to a position of dominance over those who rejected you and when i raise these who are following you these christians to that position of dominance they will remain there in that position of dominance until the end of the world this is in the quran the question is who are those who are following jesus the schoolboy jumps up and says, "No, no, no! I am a Muslim. I follow Muhammad, but I'm also following Jesus." <laughs> schoolboy, not me. I follow Muhammad <laughs> I am not a follower of Jesus. I'm a follower of Muhammad <laughs> Tell that to the schoolboy. So, a Christian people who follow Jesus. Even though that they have the Trinity and they worship Jesus as God, a Christian people are destined to be raised by Allah to a position of dominance in the world. That's already happening. That is why the United States cannot intervene in Venezuela. That is why they cannot intervene in Crimea. That's why they were defeated in Russia, I mean in Syria. The bogus jihad in Syria was destroyed. Russia took a risk. It could have been nuclear war. But the evidence is plainly and clearly appearing in the world that Russia, which is an orthodox Christian country, is now emerging as the dominant military force in the world. And that is something that Afghanistan must recognize. But I have one more verse of the Quran to quote. Allah speaks in Surah Al-Ma'idah. And he says that at that time, when the Jews are most hostile to you, and another people whose foundation is shirka, most hostile to you, waging war on Islam. At that time, there will be another people who will be closest in love and affection for you. Closest in love and affection. And there will be a people who declare we are Christians in the Nasara. And you will recognize them because they will be a people who have the institution of the priesthood. The priest is still occupying a very high position in society. The institution of priesthood is still functioning amongst them. Warahmana and they still have the monastery and the monastic way of life from the monks. In Britain, the monastery is now McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> 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 but no, they will sell the monastery, not these Christians. Well, I ask Birun, and they're not an arrogant people. They don't want to rule the world. These want to rule the world. They don't want to rule the world. 
these people are going to become closest in love and affection for you whether you like it or whether you don't. <clears throat> Your views are irrelevant, particularly if you belong to the Balkans or Turkey. Your views are irrelevant. They are going to become closest in love and affection for us Muslims whether you like it or whether you don't. And it's already happening. It's already happening. You have Christians today, despite all the boxing matches we've had in the past. You know, we won the debate. We won the debate. That's what they want. They want to debate with the Christians and win the debate. Despite that, I have to restrain myself from using harsher language. These Christians today, I'm not boasting because when you boast, Allah takes away your knowledge. But I have worked and worked and worked. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. And I've gone to them and I've told them what is Islam, not that Turkish one that came with the Ottoman Empire. They hate that Islam. They hate that Islam. They hate that Islam. They despise that Islam which came from the Ottoman Empire. And you want to revive the Ottoman Empire? <laughs> and I've gone to them with the Quran and praise is due to Allah that many of them are now accepting the Quran, the Quran is the word of the one God. Despite all of your debates that you won, wow, 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 we won the debate. That nonsense that you like, they are now accepting that the Quran is the word of the one God. 600 years of Ottoman Empire. Nobody did that. And you're praising the Ottomans? One man, only one man, with nobody supporting him. And I went amongst them. While well, everybody opposing me. And look at the story now. I'm not boasting. I'm inspiring those who want to follow. And do what I've been doing because I'm now 83 by the moment. And soon 80 by the sun. I don't know how many years I have left, whether it be even one year. But I'm planting the seeds for others to come and follow what I've been doing. So I went to them. I've just been in Albania. And the Christians say, we never heard this Islam before. We never heard this Islam before. Nobody ever came to teach us this Islam. And now they are accepting the Qur'an to be the word of the one God. And once you accept the Qur'an to be the word of the one God, you accept Muhammad and his messenger. But we prefer to remain followers of Jesus. And Allah says yes. Allah says yes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yes. You can remain a follower of Jesus even after you accepted the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says yes, and he says so in the Quran. Tell the schoolboy, shut up. Sorry I have to raise my voice because they won't study the Quran. Go to Surah to Ali Imran. Go to the second to last ayah. And Allah speaks about the people who are Ahlul Kitab. He identifies them as Ahlul Kitab, not as followers of Muhammad Ahlul Kitab, who believe in that which was sent down to you. 
and who believe in that which was sent down to them. Go check it out. They believe in that which was sent down to you and also in that which was sent down to them and they have the fear of Allah in their hearts. These are successful people. So Allah recognizes that a Christian can believe that the Quran is the word of Allah and believe that Muhammad is his messenger and yet remain a Christian, therefore Ahlul Kitab. It's time for Afghanistan to understand the world today and therefore to chart a policy in your external relations in which you will draw closer to that Christian world. I want to end now by uh, by promising to give a lecture which is long overdue. I gave this lecture maybe 20 years ago on um, an Islamic conception of an international order, Pax Islamica, an Islamic conception of an international order so that that lecture would help Afghanistan in understanding how to relate with the external world. I don't know how much of this lecture will reach Pakistan. The government of Pakistan kept the distance from me for five months I was there. The Pakistan armed forces kept the distance from me for all the months, five months I was in Pakistan. They know why. But the universities, mashallah, the universities opened their doors to me. So when I return to Pakistan, I'm going to be working with the universities, inshallah. And I hope and pray that this, this lecture may also be of some benefit, not just to Afghanistan, but also to Pakistan. Rabbana taqabal minna inna kanta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mulana inna kanta tawab rahim wa barakmatika ya Allah barakim. Amin. Assalamualaikum brothers, we're going to have a Q&A session um, where the questions please must be related specifically to the topic Sheikh has been speaking about. Uh, there will be some papers and pens coming around in a moment. If you'd like to note down what your question is, please, please keep your questions related to the topic the Sheikh has covered today. And uh, if you can pass your questions towards the front uh, and we'll pass those one by one. My, to my Sheikh. hearing is declining. That's not always a bad thing, yeah? There was a wedding in the hotel last night. My wife couldn't sleep. I slept peacefully. So we're just going to have a 10 to 15 minute break and then inshallah we'll get some questions gathered and we'll pass them over to the share. Yeah. In the interim, if there's any books or anything you want to look at, the stones on the back on the left hand side. I suggest Jerusalem in the Quran. That's the book with which you'll be able to introduce yourself to Islamic eschatology. Jerusalem in the Quran. But that's the book that we're running short now, short supply.
Send them to the front if you've got any questions.
We have no more questions. We can start. Anybody still have a question? Any 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 other questions? Okay. Come in here. All right. Okay, uh, brothers, it's going to start now with the Q&A session. Can you all take your places, please? No more questions, okay? No more questions. That's enough now. <laughs> we'll only answer these questions no more. What is my opinion about Islamic banking and uh, Islamic economics which has been introduced in the world today? The basic characteristic of the economy in a Khilafa state is that wealth would circulate through the economy. When wealth circulates through the economy, those who are rich today can be poor tomorrow and those who are poor today can be rich tomorrow. around the world today with no exception. I do not know of any exception. There's one economy prevailing around the world. And it's an economy based on riba, in which wealth no longer circulates to the economy. Around the world today, the rich remain permanently rich, despite your, your Islamic banking. Yours, not mine. <laughs> and your Islamic economics. The economy remains unchanged. That is the writing on the wall for that banking system and that economic system. It makes no change to the economy. Pakistan from day one to this day has had one economy in which the wealth is circulating only amongst the wealthy. So Fikar Ali Bhutto did make an effort to try to change that economic system. The one man who made an effort, but he did it the wrong way. He offered socialism as the alternative. State control of the economy. Our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon us, prohibited that. He gave us a free and a fair market. You can't have socialism and also have a free and a fair market. But we don't have the time to expand on that. So I'm not impressed with your so-called Islamic economics and your Islamic banking makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to the slave master slave economy around the world today. Get away from me. <coughs> Can uh, Afghanistan make an effort to establish <coughs> a Khilafa state while adopting cryptocurrency. Answer. Have you studied what is money in the Quran and the Sunnah before asking this question? If you had studied what is money in the Quran, which is absolute truth, and in the Sunnah, you would know that money in Islam 
always, always, always has intrinsic value. Does cryptocurrency have intrinsic value? Next question. <laughs> How does the defeat of the United States in Afghanistan impact on the strategy of seeking to destroy Pakistan's nuclear capability? Uh, Afghanistan does not have the military capability to defend its airspace. When the time comes for them to attack Pakistan, all they need is to fly their aircraft and their missiles over, over Afghanistan and uh, attack the Pakistan. So they'll attack Pakistan from the east, that is Modi's India, not Hindu India, Modi's India. They'll attack Pakistan from the west with their aircraft and their missiles flying over Afghanistan within really India, and Afghanistan won't be able to stop them. And they'll attack Pakistan from the sky with the Isra Israeli aircraft and Israeli missiles. So their project of destroying Pakistan nuclear capacity is not going to be significantly um, we have significant problems for them in what does that mean in Afghanistan. Should we make hijra to Afghanistan? Yes or no? Those are migrating out of Afghanistan to the other countries in the West for education, better future and so on. Is that okay? Answer? Those who want to leave Afghanistan to come to Jannah. <laughs> Jannah, of course, being Britain and the United States and France. They should be allowed to leave, all of them. Let all of them go. And those from the West who want to make it right to Afghanistan, there should be no blocks, no obstacles for them. So it'll be two-way traffic. These want to leave, let them leave. But whoever wants to go to Afghanistan, you have no immigration problems. I hope these words of mine will reach Kabul. That if you are an Islamic Emiri, if you want to be a Khilafah state, then your territory must be such that believers, wherever they are in the world, they can come and reside in your territory without any obstacles. Is it permissible for Taliban to have relations with Iran unless, unless Afghanistan builds friendly ties with Iran? You're not going to survive. You need friendly ties with Iran. You need friendly ties with Pakistan on both sides for your economic survival, not just political, economic survival. Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan has very little trade relations with the rest of the world, and that's a good thing. So Afghanistan's trade is basically with your neighbors. <coughs> Afghanistan needs to trade in order to survive. A trade for Afghanistan would be Pakistan and Iran. So yes, 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 Afghanistan needs to have good relations with Iran for the exploitation of all the abundant mineral resources of Afghanistan. Abundant mineral resources, vitally important mineral resources which will bring great wealth to Afghanistan. You need Russian and Chinese technology. And I hope, I believe they already realize that. Number two, next question, what if the United Nations recognizes the Taliban government? Answer, thank you for your recognition. We don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to deal with that. 
But if, if Afghanistan decides to stay out of the United Nations and stay out of the IMF, which I hope they would do, it's going to create serious problems for Russia and also for Iran and Pakistan and China. Serious problems. And the Russians are not going to be happy with my comment that while they are returning to their Christian roots, they have a long road still to go. The Christian must have as his political ideal the Holy State. The Holy State that was established by Nabi Dawood the Prophet David, Nabi Suleiman the Prophet Solomon, Holy Israel. And Holy Israel is a Khilafah state for us. And when the Christians went to Constantinople, Allah allowed them to conquer Constantinople without fighting. It's there in the Hadith. Allah allowed them to conquer Constantinople without fighting. And then the Christian world attempted to establish a holy state in Constantinople. That's why it was known as the Holy Byzantine Empire. It was an attempt to establish a Khilafah state. And so Russia has a long way still to go to move, over, move away from its fictition, its fix, fictition, fictition, fixation, sorry, its fixation with international law. Russia at this time is totally, totally connected, <laughs> seems to be brainwashed with international law. You have to be a member of the UN and you have to follow the charter and so on. So Russia still has a long way to go to return to its Christian heart, the Holy State. So if Afghanistan chooses to stay out of the UN and stay out of the IMF, which they ought to do, it's going to create serious problems for Russia. And now that Putin has made a deal with Imran Khan, the Russia and Pakistan will coordinate their policies for Afghanistan. It means that if an Afghanistan which chooses to stay out of the UN, and stay out of the IMF, will also now pose serious problems for Pakistan. It also poses serious problems for Iran because Iran says we are an Islamic revolution. <coughs> and after 40 years of the Islamic revolution, Iran is still a member of the UN and still a member of the IMF. Enough for that. <laughs> Last question, will the Afghan people use only physical gold coins and silver coins for the daily transactions? I forgot, I should have mentioned, I'm glad for this question, that when you declare dinar and dirham as legal tender, the Afghan paper money must still continue in the market. Did I say so? No. Okay. You do not ban the bogus paper money overnight and bring dinar and dirham overnight. It's, called, it's going to cause a chaos in the market. It has to be a transition over a period of time. This is the methodology given in the Quran. A transition from this to that over a period of time. So the Afghan paper money will continue in the market when the dinar and dirham is introduced as legal tender. You can use both monies. However, when the reason why the IMF prohibited the use of gold as money is because when gold and silver come into the market, bogus money collapses. So as soon as dinar and dirham are recognized as legal tender in Afghanistan, there's going to be a rush 
to get gold and silver. And people are going to be dumping their paper. And so the Afghan paper money will be in a free fall. And it will collapse by itself without the government having to make it illegal. Um, in the, I mentioned to you in the event that you do not have an adequate supply of gold and silver coins in the market in Medina, they would use dates as money. Our profit would use dates as money. So in Afghanistan, you could make a deal with Pakistan to use wheat as money because Pakistan has an abundance of wheat. Is it permissible to use a representation of the gold and silver dirham and dinar in the form of a paper or digital format? The Prophet said that in Akhirat a man there be great liars, so beware. When you have total confidence that you can accept a check instead of cash, total confidence, you will accept the check. Otherwise, you say, no, give me the cash. <laughs> right? So the paper would be accepted only from those in whom you have total confidence that they have credibility. And that the value of the paper will remain unchanged. If the paper it's called a promissory note if the paper is to be accepted. That's how the Bank of England started in 1796. The Bank of England, which used to issue gold coins, the sterling pound was a gold coin. In 1796, the Bank of England was established and then they started to issue promissory notes like checks. But the banker suddenly realized, but oh, wait, I, if I have a hundred gold coins, a hundred ounces of gold, I can write, write or checks for more than a hundred and get away with it. <laughs> Nobody would know. That's how the system became corrupted. So the, the amount of corruption has already, deception has already taken place in the world of money. Those who have confidence in that paper are really foolish people. <laughs> when our prophet prophesied that there'd be great liars in the end time, so beware. My preference is that we actually deal, we deal with the actual gold and silver coins. Okay, that's all the questions that we have. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow night. Uh, the the, the <coughs> flyer is on my YouTube channel. It's a masjid in Hilford in London. And it's uh, Biological Warfare and Akhir Zaman. We pray that we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make grant uh, blessings to all those of you who attended this lecture and grant that these words of mine may reach them in Kabul. <laughs> The Sheikh will be signing some books. If everyone can just remain seated for a while, uh, for a few moments.